What's up, everybody? Welcome to Defender Fridays. Uh, this is a little bit of a different setup than we had last week. Thanks to everybody who joined last week as well. Um, I know that one was a little more mobile. We're going to try and get Roberto on for an actual show show as well sometime in the future. But uh, nonetheless, it's great to have everyone there. And this is Hacker Summer Camp Recap episode. So the goal of today is uh, not really to like have a special guest with a particular topic, but to make everyone here realize that you're all special guests. Especially Whitney, especially Whitney, the the specialist of all guests. Um, but no, we're here. Uh, I'm Matt, and uh, uh, we know Eric's here as well. Uh, Eric, I just I, first off, man, uh, we got to spend nine days together back at Black Hat DEF CON. It was pretty awesome. Um, if you had to describe all that in like three words, what would you say? Put you on the spot. Oh, man, uh, describe the whole Black Hat DEF CON experience in three. Yeah, words. before I zoom in, before I zoom in. Give Matt cookies. <laughs> All right. That's a good starting point. That's a good starting point for anybody who knows. It was epic. Oh, Whitney wins. Whitney wins on the, uh, on, on, on the, on the adjective there. But no, so really quick recap for everybody who may or may not have uh, had a chance to be out there. Um, can I get a quick like thumbs up or something in the chat? If you got a chance to be at Black Hat Def Con, I'd love to know who else was there just so I can maybe call some of y'all up on stage. Or something like that. I would, I would love. Okay, Newman was there. Awesome. All right. I can't see everybody's camera, so Newman's the only thumbs up I saw. Wade, I know you were there. I know Wade was there. I said Wade came over and said hi. Oh, Marcus, look at Marcus, dude. Marcus, you got one of the world's most interesting backgrounds right there. All right, Ryan Chapman. Ryan, man, did you come to the Blue Team Village at all? I got to moderate a panel at the Blue Team Village, and it was one of the highlights of my trip. It was freaking awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. You know what wasn't a highlight of your trip? Swinging by the uh, Blue Team Village and saying hi to the CTF organizers. I, was just, I just put in the chat earlier, I can't believe I didn't see any of you there. That's ridiculous. It's okay. It's all right. Next time. We, we, I have a feeling we'll all be back there next year. So, no, I wanted to take this episode. And uh, first off, uh, everyone who is out there, I hope you've all recovered. Uh, I'm seeing various LinkedIn posts, tweets, whatever. Do we call them tweets anymore? I don't know. Whatever. Seeing various social media things that some folks came down with various whatnots. And we're not hoping that was nobody here. Um, but first off, I wanted to start out by uh, saying we had an awesome, awesome run, awesome time out there. Uh, between uh, Eric, Whitney, and myself, we had a chance to get into a awesome four-day training. Um, we, we had two days of actual Black Hat itself, and then we had an amazing three days of DEF CON. So we actually went like full bookend to bookend the entire time. Uh, yeah, Nick, there you go. Yo, hats off to Nick who came by and said what's up at the village a bunch as well. Still recovering. I love it. Um, so first off, let's talk about the, the training. And this is an open forum, everyone, as always. If anyone's got anything they'd like to chime in with, uh, feel free to jump in and be like, hey, I saw this thing. It was it was pretty awesome. Happy to, you know, if you want to throw a hand up or something, happy to kind of uh, democratize that. But I'll start out with the training. Uh, for anyone who's unaware, um, the Black Hat is not actually just a two-day roadshow of amazing sales booths. And whatnot. There's actually a uh, there's four days before Black Hat starting where it's training focused, and that can be a combination of two day classes or four day classes depending on what gets set up there. And um, we had a chance to run a four day class there, which was a, an amazing experience. If for anyone who's taken cybersecurity training before or been through them, you know that sometimes it can be like just fire hoses of knowledge, just absolutely demolishing your brain on a daily basis. Uh, Eric and I do very well at that. Um, <laughs> Jeff knows what I'm talking about, but no, we, we tend to focus on like the real world experience side of things and try to get folks in there and uh, actually digging around and hunting through evidence. And luckily, like when Charlie got to be a part of that and uh, it was, it was a really cool experience to be out there. Uh, students from all over the world, Eric, how many do we have? I think total 31, yeah, 31, 31 students from all over the world. Ah, there's Whitney. Come on, Whitney. Where you at? Oh, there we go. Try to look and see everyone looking at me, staring at my camera. 31 students from around the world. Let me see. Representation. We had Singapore, Australia. UK. Uh, UK. Yeah, definitely UK. Uh, was there Germany in there as well? Might have been. I can't remember. But, but regardless. But, but, but to, to, to add a finer point to this, like, and again, not to, not to pitch, you know, a training that Matt and I and Whitney ran, um, but I, I, th I do think that there's, there's something like universally valuable in sort of our our approach to these trainings that we run. And it's that, you know, personally, what I think is experiential learning is the absolute best way to absorb content and, and build expertise in this space. 
And so when we build these trainings, like, you know, there's a four day training, right? Which for any of you that have taken four or five day trainings from other places, I'll just leave it at that. You know that that usually means it's going to be chock full of PowerPoint slides, hundreds and hundreds of PowerPoint slides, right? How else do you fill that time? Um, we go the opposite approach. It's a four day training with very, very, very few slides. It's all experiential hands on because personally, that's how I learned uh, coming up. And so I just I'm a big fan of that. And so for anybody that's looking at like, hey, how do I how do I choose training? How do I pursue training? My personal stance on that is look at things that are more experiential uh, than academic, because I think one of the one of the common things that I hear is that like, yeah, a lot of like the big academic programs, they're great. You know, they'll stick, they'll stick you in several semesters of coursework um, and then you're going to pop out and say, but I still don't know how to do any of this stuff. Um, but you could go through four, four or five days of experiential and come out light years ahead. Right. And so it just again, personal opinion, I'm not going to speak for everybody. Uh, when I say that I think experiential training is the way to go, and that's the way that we package up and deliver our training. So it's all it's all live fire. It's all, hey, you know, you get this big, you know, simulated range and attacks are unfolding and Matt and I are, are doing the song and dance of here's how to threat hunt. Whitney's in the back of the room holding up that entire virtual environment and everything inside of it. And uh, and it's pretty cool that I think the three of us can do that. We, uh, we've been doing it now, what, five years, man? Um, yeah. Yeah. Five years now. Oh my goodness. So this is not just the recap of this year too. This is a, like a, a tradition now. And it's, it's a ton of fun, but let me tell you, let me tell you where this segues into our DEF CON activities. So obviously great. We ran a four day training at Black Hat. You know, not everybody's got the budget to go and sit in a four day training at Black Hat, but there's something for everybody here because basically what we do is we take that same environment that we use to deliver that training. We take that same environment and we delivered a 100% free CTF at the Blue Team Village this year of Control Alt Detect. And I know, you know, several of you have probably heard me talk about this a couple of times, but now we're on the other side of it. And I gotta say, uh, you know, with, with the, we had a small team of people helping us deliver this thing um, because it was a massive undertaking and a huge lift, but we had nearly 200 people come and sit down in Blue Team Village and do the CTF. And I, I could not have asked for a better like inaugural run of the CTF. You used mm -hmm. really smooth, very polished. And again, using the same concepts, right? Like the CTF was not meant to be like a, hey, go find the puzzle inside this image that means nothing, right? Like, no, it's like, no, go hunt these four APT actors that have broken into this investigation or broke into this in in environment and perform an investigation uh, from start to finish of each one of these attack chains because, hey, that's actually something you can use in the real world. Like, that's just not real world. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think we're big fans of, you know, sort of providing experiential hands-on ex uh, activity that uh, directly contributes to things that you can put into, pla into practice uh, at a day job. I'll, I'll, uh, if, if I may broaden the horizon just a little bit, um, I, I love well put together classes where there is a, a learning objective and there are wonderful labs and such all the way through. Um, but I always want to have people focus on keep the learning going. Your own lab environment, you will continue to learn. And frankly, the, the lessons you learn the best are the ones you architect in your own lab environment. Uh, so yes, do other people's learning, go through it, but also keep that learning going. I always tell people the same two things for improving their career. Build your own lab environment, usually a home lab, and learn to program, learn some automation because your human finger, meat fingers are limited in how many keyboards they can touch, whereas your code can touch a lot of machines. <laughs> Dang, I like That's that cool. abstraction that we just got from Jeff there. Your code can reach many, your fingers can only reach one. <clears throat> I like it. Uh, you hit like one of the nails on the head. I just want to echo what everyone's saying here. Like for those of you who uh, are watching this and are like, man, I, you know, like you're reading something about analysis, articles, whatever discipline you might be in and whatnot. Like, and you're, you're always like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could see that. Just find a way to get hands on, find a way to get hands on and start learning that way. Uh, I'm going to drop a link in once I find it to uh, Eric's Eric's post about, so you want to be a SOC analyst. Eric, not to like toot your horn too much, but it's really easy to do. But like, yeah, hey, I want to start to get hands on. I'm going to start to walk through a course like that. And then the other side of it is 
constantly look for ways to like test and push uh, what your limitations or what your knowledge of something might be. So funny enough, um, one of the things that I like to like recommend to folks who are like maybe maybe seasoned blue teamers who come to DEF CON and they're like, hey, I'm going to go sit and do this CTF for like three years straight, four years straight. I'm going to tell you right now, we love to have you in there, but go spend a couple hours at the Red Team Village or at the Offensive Security Village and just take a look and just see what else is happening out there. Awesome, Eric dropped in. Thank you. Go and uh, go go, t- go take a look and see what what the attackers are doing, the adversaries, some of the things they're looking at, and just use it as an opportunity to like broaden those horizons as well. Because you'd be surprised the number of times as blue teamers, especially as defenders, really easy mm-hmm. to get stuck inside of those educational ruts. You know, where you're like, if I have one bias. Sorry, yeah. if I have one bias, it's that every field helps every field. You're a better attacker if you're a better defender, if you're a better admin, oh, if you're a better forensicator, etc. So cross train, uh, speak, speak outside of your area of expertise. Absolutely agreed. Yes, all day. And while and, and again, while you can while you can endlessly pursue sort of the um, the textbook knowledge of the concepts that you're you're hoping to master, nothing comes close to actually doing the thing, right? That's kind of the recurrent theme here. And, you know, to, to echo Jeff's point and things that Matt has said, um, <clears throat> one of my favorite things about building these range environments for delivering either a training or a CTF or what have you is that I have never been able to get closer to the metal of what exactly does Cobalt Strike or Sliver or Empire or, you know, any of these tools, what does it actually look like on both sides of the coin? Right. When the attacker runs this command, what exact telemetry gets generated on that endpoint? Right. Um, and furthermore, the opportunity to learn that there are all kinds of weird, bendable rules about what's going to happen there. Right. Because where, you know, in a, in, a, in a course, I could teach you, I could say, this, this, when this action happens, this is the outcome. And every single time, this is what's going to happen. And then you go into a lab and you do that thing and you learn that, wait a minute. Yeah, four out of five times that's what happened, but then there was this one exception, right? You learn that like so few of these rules are truly written in stone, and that that the only thing that you can you can count on is that things are going to be unpredictable. Um, and that's an important thing to know as a defender, right? That like your signatures, your controls, your whatever it is that you're relying on every single day is not reliable. I, I hate to be the one to say that, um, <laughs> but. Don't fear the data, right? Instead, like embrace it and understand why, like defense in depth and all these things are so important. Because I can tell you right now, I have seen Defender, Smart Screen, EDR, Sysmon, and all these things I have seen selectively fail for no specific reason whatsoever. It's just like I've run this attack a hundred times and twice in the, that 100 times, that control just simply failed. It failed open. It didn't detect it. It didn't stop it. It didn't alert on it. It just for no reason whatsoever. And, you know, and, and again, like it, it's because, you know, we, we taught rocks how to think and, and thought that everything would be perfect. But, um, but it, it, what I love about it again, is just, it's the knowing, right? Like you, you think that things work the way that they do, but it doesn't hurt to like get under the hood and actually test these theories and see if that is the case. Worst case scenario, you're going to learn it. Some. You're going to learn a lot. Let me add a, another viewpoint in that too for everyone as well. Uh, I, I also think that there's interdisciplinary cross training, which is important to know. So one of the things that I've always tried to make a parallel between for folks is like, okay, you can be an, an expert forensic investigator, you know, and it's like, oh, program execution, I got that covered. I know 80 different places to go and find that thing. I know how to parse them. I know how to read them. I know how to analyze them. And I'm like, cool. Uh, the adversary is live in the environment. So I need you to do all of that, but I need you to do it within a small period of time. So for those of you who are like maybe transitioning into more, I'm going to call it like a real-time role, for lack of a better term, but I'm transitioning more into a monitoring role where I've got to make quicker decisions. Maybe you're leading a team and you're trying to like, how do I evaluate risk versus not? That that real-time experience, a, a thing is happening right now. You don't have time to like, all right, let me run this collection. Go bring back all these things and do all this kind of stuff, right? I don't have an hour to parse prefetch. I have a couple minutes to determine, did this thing run? Which account ran it? And then what's the impact of that? So that's the other big takeaway from lab environments is like, did you see credential harvesting run or deploy? Yes, I did. Cool. What does that mean? Like, that's one of the things that I encourage everyone to think about too, is like, oh, I detected a password spray or I detected a password harvester. Great. What's, what's next? What's the risk 
I mean, what's the carry on to the organization after that? What's the carry on to the enterprise? Like, what does it mean? And we had a really cool time, a huge, I don't know if they're in here. I don't, I don't think Tim's in here and not Eric. I know you put this one together, but I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Tim Bedin as well, because we did get a chance to actually put one of his signature Hallmark moves into, uh, into practice during uh, some of our scenarios. There was some Kerber roasting. And, and that's one of the other little things I want to drop in is uh, trainings can also help you experience things that you might not see in other places. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go back to the workplace and you're going to be like, oh, okay, everything's corporosity everywhere. But when you hear about those sometimes esoteric or really kind of vague techniques, you know, it's, it's not always easy for everybody to experience. Um, you know, like what's a golden ticket attack? How do I find it? How do I detect it? A lab environment is going to be the best place to say, here's all the telemetry enabled and here's what it looks like. Now I'm going to cut out pieces of telemetry. What can I still lean on? What can I defend on? And lab environments are the best time to do that. Uh, it is, it's good to learn by fire, but it's not good to be in the middle of an incident response with, you know, everything burning ransomware about to deploy. And you're like, hang on tight, everybody. I need to go collect the disk image, right? We got to, <laughs> there's also new forensic artifacts that you find having done it in a lab environment. And like, I, I'm big on the fog of war works both ways. Attackers don't know what little telltale got them caught. So the fact that the source computer name is revealed during PS exec, as Eric recently found out by going through in his own lab environment, that is not a commonly talked about forensic artifact. Like you find these things and anytime you surprise the attacker with a thing that you found that is not a common artifact, you have won that round and may be able to kick them out because of that thing. All the yeah, Jeff. I almost <clears throat> I almost brought that up as an example to make your previous point, but uh, but yeah, exactly that. Like I've I've looked at PS exactly the lower movement tool for years, and this new this new observable was discovered sometime around like 2021. You know, a blog post was made, a YouTube was made, but like I'm busy. Like I'm not watching every DFIR YouTube video that gets published. Right, like it just isn't happening. But because I'm an avid user of lab environments and, and, and running these TTPs, I, I discovered it on my own. I, I thought, oh, wow, this is a new thing. Well, it's not really new. It's been around since 2021. But I discovered it because of the, the sort of um, the adversary emulation and that we go out in there and study the pieces. And there's, there's a really cool uh, effect to that. But what I, what I love most about it for like our students as well as our CTF participants is it also gets you to ask those, those compelling questions like, okay, so the threat actor got in via RDP and we can confirm based on X, Y, and Z artifacts that they opened some files in the user profile. Okay, let me ask you this. Have we confirmed XFIL has occurred? And it's one of my favorite trick questions to throw in a room full of people because you're going to get a bunch of mixed results. You know, you're going to have some people that will say, well, no, because... I don't see a tool. I don't see an Excel tool, right? Like, because what am I looking for? I'm looking for SCP or FTP or or R clone or some like, you know, I'm looking for Excel.exe having run on this box, and I don't see it. So no, I don't think uh, Excel has occurred. But yeah, I see Ryan. He's he's a couple steps ahead of me here. But then the way I like to bring it back together is okay. Well, hold on. Let's let's go back to what we know. We know that the attacker was using an interactive log on a remote desktop session, right? Uh, GUI uh, 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 sort of access. And we know that they were opening these files. Has XFIL not already occurred now, right? What's to say that they're not taking screen grabs or recording their screen while they're opening these documents? Do we absolutely need to see upload.exe happen to say that files of an XFIL, right? It's like, these are the critical thoughts that like nobody really thinks about until they're staring at it. You're staring at the evidence now. What is it telling you, right? And uh, and, and and just sort of wanting to be in a situation where the first time you're answering that question, it's not for real. Right? Like that, that's my favorite part about what we do is it's like, hey, now you've been through it and you you've learned that maybe your first assumption was wrong, but that's okay because nobody's going to judge you here. That's fine. But definitely don't go tell your board of directors the same thing you just told me. <laughs> like, like if you yeah. find yourself in a similar situation. Yeah. Practice. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, Eric's hitting on a really, really valid point for everyone, which is I think like being able to observe and temper the results and then also understand who your audience is going to be when you talk to them as well. You know, because I'll tell you one thing. 
as someone who's been in this seat, the last thing any of y'all want to do is get in front of the org or C-suite or whatever. Be like, yo, they ran the sickest implant of Mimi Cats I've ever seen in my life, right? That's it's not going to fly. That's, that, that's going to be very, very difficult for folks to understand. But if you go the other way, uh, and that, that's how we get uh, news articles that say the adversary used a sophisticated bat file in order to download or credentials or whatever. That's how we get there because the delivery is always like, oh my gosh. But when you see it and you're like, okay, um, I know that the general process of dumping credentials involves touching the process that has them and extracting them. Then that breaks it down to, I have a better way to, number one, describe it, right? The adversary harvested credentials. What, what kind did they get? They got local admin. They got a service account. They got domain admin, whatever. Let's apply the risk accordingly. Two, it also makes you a better detection engineer. So one of the things that we constantly talked about over the past week as well was like, how would you go through and detect this? You know, do I want to detect a, like, and, and I came up with this really weird analogy like 10 seconds ago of like, if I wanted to detect a car driving down a road, right? Would you write it a detection which says, okay, I'm looking for red paint, four windows, four wheels, and headlights. How much of those parts of the car could you break out? Could you go even further and say, I'm looking for an engine with wheels? for any paint color like there's ways to just break this out and then you get people like jeff who come along and they're like oh i listen to all these forensic nerds talk about stuff so i go after the hibernation file which i know is going to have some credentials inside of it as well easy ben no no no. we already got your information man you're all set you're good um but yeah so but but this is this is what one of the benefits of like these lab and discussion environments work on for everyone is you get a chance to uh, I'm going to come back to Ryan's comment in just a second here. You get a chance to be like, okay, cool. Here's all the, like, and, and we talk about this a lot during some of the things that we run is like adversaries watch what we're doing, right? They watch what we're doing. They watch the techniques they watch what we talk about. And then you just continue to explore and find new ways to go it. And I'm always looking at it like, cool. So like Jeff, I'm going to use you as an example. Jeff just gave me an advantage here, which is what normal user is ever accessing hyperfill.sys? Like what user is logged in and it's like, you know what I'm gonna do right now? I'm thinking I'm gonna grab a copy of the hibernation file. I, I might have an anomaly or an easy detection to find in it. And then I like what Ryan just dropped in. About to, to some extent, the more esoteric the attack, the yeah. stronger the signal if you do have a detective control fire fire for it. Nobody calls right. net1.exe normally. So if you add a detective control for someone calling net one explicitly, it's a really damn high fidelity signal. I love it. I love it. Oh, and I'll test that. Yeah, there we go. There's another one. Uh, all good, Ryan. Sorry, right, man. We didn't see a blue team village and you're bouncing out early. It's okay. We'll let it go. Um, but uh, yeah, so for those of you who dropped in and said Sigma is a good way to, as an example, to then hone and refine, 100% on board with that too. Is it's Remember, Sigmas are defined to be generic, high level. You can apply this to a wide range of technologies. It might not be used. It might not be your environment specifically. Y'all, that's exactly how public detection rules should be written, right? Oh. Is Pair down the false positives if you can, if you need to, but then look at them as an example and be like, okay, this is what it looks like when run dll32.exe reaches out to the internet. Oh, look at that right there. Or or when run dll32 is touching a process they shouldn't be touching. Now, the funny thing I like about it is looking at that little line that Eric just dropped in there, everyone, and we'll just like do some quick detection engineering over the next minute. Let's talk about using public and just think to ourselves really quick, like how many times do you see average user accounts or activity Hit users public. I would start with that question. I would start with that question, and that's a great detection engineering way, a great way to get started, great investigation starting point, great threat hunting starting point, all of the above. I got to read through all these comments. But I mean, to, 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 from looking at it, looking at it from the other the other angle, why on earth would the attacker put it in such a suspicious directory? See users public, right? Like why public? Like. These are, these are the things to think about, right? It's not an arbitrary choice. It was, a, it was a pretty calculated choice. It's because they know that universally anyone can write to that, right? So it's, it's almost like a temp directory, but in some cases it's even like easier to use than some temp directories. Um, so yeah, like watching for weird stuff, hitting a public directory, <laughs> watching for, you know, lss.dmp, which believe it or not is more common than you might think. Um, Jeff, you'd love this one. One of our attack scenarios, um, Use PowerShell remoting against the domain controller to NTDS util back up the NTS and put it in Syslog, which means that any domain user now could just fetch it. So it could have been system A hitting it with the invoke command and system Z reaching in and grabbing it for Hexville. Dirty. I thought you might have. I thought you might appreciate that one. 
Hey, if I can jump in real quick, I just want to throw it out here. What's up, Brian? You're back. For folks, by the way. Yeah, I just I'm probably got the bounce roll soon, but we're almost done. My first security conference was a conference called Cactus Con in Phoenix back in 2013. My first experience there was a workshop. It was a four hour workshop and I lost my damn mind uh, uh, over how much I learned with that kinesthetic training. And the fact that you folks constantly push the envelope for people to do that and to get their hands on the keyboard, like I absolutely freaking adore that. And just keep doing what you're doing because if anyone here has not yet been involved with the CTF or been involved with the workshop or not done something where you get your hands on and actually run the commands and do the things like you absolutely need to do it because it's just the best freaking way to learn. So I know I'm referring to things we talked about a, a, a while back, but I had to bounce. So I'm back. You're good, dude. <laughs> but, Ryan, Ryan, you got a lot of support for CactusCon in the chat, man. I'm just saying, like, oh, you know, yeah. oh good. We might need to have a yeah. DF meetup at some point. I mean, there's so much CactusCon yeah. love in that chat. Yeah, buddy. CactusCon, CactusCon is in my my top three for sure. Awesome, love it. Um, we we got a couple minutes left in the uh, in the session here, and uh, I, I don't want to call and put people on the spot, but Marcus, Wade, Leonard, Nick. I know some of y'all were at the uh, event as well. Anyone got anything to chime in? Anything they want to add? Uh, like, this is the thing I saw that blew my mind. Chris, you came off mute, so I'm going to call on you first. <laughs> I was just going to comment on what a great conversation I had with Marcus about donkeys. Uh, we oh, probably went on for about so, an so, hour so, exchanging. Sir, we, only have a, we only have a minute and a half left in this session. Yeah, I don't have time for parts of donkeys right now. Time. Stop it, man. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hijack that thread. I'm gonna talk about one cool thing that went down at the CTF, and I think some folks might appreciate. So, um, one of one of the really cool challenges we have this year was, uh, and and Matt Matt did a lot of the work on this one. So we had written uh, a ransomware payload that was gonna, you know, un un unleash hell on, on the environment. And as one of the like final, final, final challenges that we give to a team, it's like, okay, you've already worked the whole investigation. Now here's the ransomware payload. Um, reverse engineer it and see if you can extract out the, you know, AES-256 key and the IV, right? And to prove that you were able to extract it out, here's some ciphertext decrypted, right? Like, so literally like reverse engineer the, the ransomware and uh, decrypt this encrypted text. Um, and we had one team do it and they did it way faster than we expected. We knew it was possible because it wasn't, this wasn't an ultra sophisticated malware. We knew it was possible. We just were surprised, I think, with how fast they did it. The winning team that uh, is the one that got it. Turns out they got a guy that's on the uh, Google uh, reverse engineering team. And uh, now what's cool, though, I want to share how he did it because it was actually not rocket science. It's something any one of you could do. So once he figured out that the malware was written in Autoit, he knew intuitively that there's a Clam AV plugin that automatically unpacks and decompiles Autoit scripts. So he just did that. Like no, no craziness, no wild tools, a free open source antivirus engine uh, with the Autoit uh, sort of uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, resource and then just boom, unpacked it and found the goods. And so that was one way we didn't even consider. Uh, I thought that was pretty awesome. So I just wanted to share that because that was kind of cool. But life lesson. Yeah. Lots of places in life have cheat codes, make things a lot easier. Try to find those cheat codes whenever you can. Stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> there we go. Exactly right. I love Sorry, it. Folks. Uh, Jeff, J Jeff, we're going to call those efficiency links. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Eric, sorry, go ahead, Matt. I think we're right at time. Your quick reminder before we wrap it up. Yep, it's the time of the hour, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, be sure to join Slack if you want to be eligible to get that T-shirt that we hand out once every week to one lucky guest that comes on. Um, Slack.lemacharlie.io. Um, otherwise, Matt, unless you have anything else. Good to go, y'all. Thanks you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend.